One of the reasons I've been able to remain employed by the same employer for 35 years, I started at UF in 1976, and this is 2011, is because they let me teach courses. And in teaching courses, I get to meet a lot of nice people, like Laura, like you, and uh, some of the courses I teach are listed. I've been teaching the Arboriculture course at UFF since the 1980s, and I teach several other courses too. And you can take those courses, some of them are online, you don't even have to come to one of our centers, you can take them at home. So I always like to tell you that you don't have to go to Gainesville if you want to be a gator. There's a picture of one of the arboriculture classes on a field trip, and I just had to throw this in because this is a tree that people either love to hate or they hate to love. It's the, uh, it's the oldest Melaleuca tree in Florida. It was planted by Frank Sterling in 1908. He received the seedling from the U.S. Department of Agriculture in 1908, more than 100 years ago. The USDA was actually encouraging that plant. And Mr. Sterling planted it in Davy, and it's still there. And that's the uh, champion emeritus Melaleuca. One of the things that's interesting about that tree, it's not a very desirable tree nowadays because too many of them are planted. It's kind of like what your mother and father used to tell you about chocolate. Too much of it is a bad thing. Just the right amount of it's a good thing. Melaleuca is kind of like chocolate. The, this is the second one that was ever planted in Florida. The first one was planted by a USDA scientist in Coconut Grove in earlier in 1908, and it died after five months. And the official USDA notebook for that tree said, this tree may not be suitable for growing in Florida. It may not be matched for our environment. It's one of those cases where if we could tell that person now um, <laughs> what actually happened with that tree species, it might be, uh, it might be an eye-opener for whoever that was, although he's probably no longer there. The USDA is currently against that tree, and they're working to use biological control methods to uh, reduce its numbers. But this is the sort of classroom material that some of the classes at U of F uh, make the students do. They look at the good and the bad and the ugly, and this is just one example. The topic that Laura asked me to speak on is hazard trees in the landscape environment. And it's a particularly important topic when we're anticipating high wind speeds, but it's an important topic all year round because it can happen anywhere and it does happen anywhere. When you talk to tree care professionals, they can all tell you that the tree care profession is a dangerous or a potentially dangerous profession. We all know of cases like the one on the screen where a tree care worker was electrocuted while trimming a tree. Sometimes they get too close to a power line, they conduct electricity and they die. Sometimes accidents with motorized equipment can cause injury and death. We all know that the tree care profession is a potentially dangerous one and people have to show due care. What a lot of people don't know is that the landscaped environment, although the landscape environment gives a lot more than it takes. Landscape environments are more good than bad. There are some cases where people get hurt. Not the workers in the landscape, but the people who use the landscape get hurt. I took this news story off the web. It was on the uh, MSNBC website. It made the front page of the New York Times. It was last summer, July of 2010. A family visited Central Park in New York City, one of the nicest, grandest parks in the United States. There's a small zoo in Central Park, and it was a small family, a husband, a wife, and a, and a baby. I believe it was a six-month-old baby. And they paused by the entrance to the zoo in Central Park so the husband could take a picture of his wife and the baby. And a limb fell out of the tree above them, and it killed the baby in her mother's arms, and it seriously injured the mother as the father was taking a picture. It happened in front of hundreds of people. There was something wrong with the limb attachment of that limb and that tree. And this made all the news. Some of you may remember hearing it on the radio or seeing it on TV. It was a terrible tragedy. Um, and this is one example. And it's an extreme example, it's a heartbreaking example of how landscapes can, in some cases, in some situations, be hazardous to the people that use them. 
Uh, this is a case closer to home. This was in Titusville. It happened in 03. Happened uh, eight years ago. Young woman was jogging in the morning, and a tree fell over and killed her. It was an early morning jogger. There were no witnesses. The people who lived on that street, when they woke up that morning, they looked outside and they saw a tree laying on the ground. They called the city, and the city sent a cleanup crew. And it was the cleanup crew who discovered the dead woman. She never, apparently never saw what hit her because it hit her from behind. Tree fell over. Here's a case. This was back in the 1980s. Uh, this was a very famous one when it happened. It happened in Fort Lauderdale. A young boy, 11 years old, playing in, his, his, his home, in, in, the, in the backyard of his home. <clears throat> his mother was inside cooking supper. Little kids do what little kids do. They climb trees. The kid climbed the tree. A branch broke. The kid fell down and he became a quadriplegic. Luckily, a neighbor saw it, called 911, and it was in southwest Lauderdale, not very far from Broward General Hospital. The first responders got there within three or four minutes, and he was in the hospital within 15 minutes after it happened. But he's a quadriplegic. Uh, I was an expert witness in this case. Sometimes college professors get called upon to do expert witness service in cases. Um, and uh, in Florida, when lawsuits occur, uh, the first stage of the trial is to determine liability, and the second stage in the trial is to, deter is to determine the, the extent of the damages that have to be awarded. And in this particular trial, the, the jury found that the uh, property owner was 50% responsible, the child was 35% responsible, and the mother was 15% responsible. Now, in Florida, there's a legal concept called joint and several liability, which means if three people get judged to be responsible for something and liable, and only one of them has money, the person that has money pays for the whole thing. And that's, that's a tenet of law, not just in Florida, but here. Uh, I was retained by one of the defendants. Um, actually, I was retained by the insurance company that had the insurance policy for one of the defendants because the insurance company wanted to settle out. And whenever the settlement is more than a million dollars, they have to have an, ex uh, an expert who has no connection with the case look at the files and visit the site and, and write a report. And um, obviously, I recommend that they settle immediately because the second phase of the trial for damages would probably be an extreme amount. So several of the insurance companies settled out. And the case was, you know, resulted in multi-million dollars of awards because there were several defendants. The property owner was 50% liable, but it turned out in court records the property owner, uh, this was a rental house. The mother was a single mom and she rented the home and the property owner had only owned the house for one year. And the incorrect hat rack pruning that resulted in the epicormic branch formation that Laura talked to you about, and that branch that failed, causing the boy to fall and become paralyzed, happened when the place was owned by a previous owner who had a previous landscape business taking care of the house. But the current owner was still judged liable, 50%. He went ahead and sued the previous owner, and everybody sued the landscape company, and it was a real mess. The whole thing could have been avoided had the tree not been hat racked. Part of what I had to do is, well, I, I climbed the tree, and I found the branches that had failed, and it was a clear open and shut case of weakly attached epicormic branches that caused that little, little kid to fall. So I don't want to scare you, <laughs> but... People who are in the landscape management business are held to a higher standard than the average person. The fact that you are professionals in landscape management means that society expects you to be able to advise property owners if there is a hazardous condition. In that previous case, that landscape company not only didn't advise the property owner, but that landscape company caused the hazardous condition. But when you're doing landscape management work, even if you're not retained to advise the client that there could be a hazard and you see a hazard, you should report it. 
If you're a worker, you should report it to your supervisor. If you're a supervisor, you should report it to the property owner or the property manager. It's the property manager's responsibility to make a decision about what to do. It's your responsibility to report a potentially hazardous condition if you see it. Would you like to sit on that bench and have a nice picnic? Is there anything wrong with that picture? There's a cross branch directly above that. I had to drag the bench and put it there to get that picture, by the way. The, the property owner didn't have the bench there. I, I wanted to get, I put the bench back after I took the picture. When you have cross branches, what happens? When they increase their diameter, they become rubbing branches. When they become rubbing branches, the bark fails and decay organisms get in. And one or both of the rubbing branches ultimately goes down and hits the ground. This is a semi-staged picture. I did move the bench. I, the, the property owner was advised, and they've since had it corrected. They've had the, least, uh, the, the lesser quality of the two rubbing branches removed. When you're doing general landscape work, you may be hired to do a fertilizer assignment for this landowner, or maybe you're hired to do pruning. But if you see a potentially hazardous situation, you should report it to your supervisor, to the property owner. I managed to talk my wife <laughs> into uh, posing for me. She and her cousin stood in the uh, opening of a hollow tree. One of the concepts about hazardous tree situations is that in order for a tree to be hazardous, there has to be a target. There has to be a piece of property. There has to be a, a person. There has to be something of value that could be injured or hurt or killed if the tree fails. And this was in a national park in California. And uh, I made them run in there and pretend they were having a lot of fun. And as soon as I took the pictures, get out of there. A tree like this in the middle of a landscape shopping center parking lot would be unreasonable. A tree like this in the middle of a national forest in California where you have to walk two miles from the nearest road is a reasonable thing for the National Forest to allow. But there has to be a target that has value in order for a hazard to occur.